husband and wife stabbed in their own home by a complete stranger. I was stabbed 12 times. My right lung was collapsed. Uh, then he turned on my wife. In an exclusive interview you'll only see on Fox 13 News, the victims of this random attack tell us how their next door neighbors saved their lives. It was a beautiful day across the state. Coming up, what you can expect for your weekend forecast. <laughs> But they are killing people. Iranians in Utah coming together to stand in solidarity with those protesting back home. A threat to detonate a nuclear reactor on campus if the Utes lost a football game. Be careful and, and uh, think before you post. The bizarre incident that led to one student's arrest and why police are taking it so seriously. An Army veteran is walking across the country from Oregon to Maine, and he's just made it in Utah. Coming up, the special reason why. Live from Utah's news leader, Fox 13 News at 9 starts right now. They were stabbed while sleeping inside their own home by a complete stranger, and they survived. Tonight, the Taylorsville couple, who were victims of this random crime, are sharing their story. Thanks for joining us, everyone. I'm Kelly Chapman. And I'm Bob Evans. In an exclusive interview you'll only see here, Fox 13 News reporter Jenna Bree spoke with both of them about the frightening ordeal and who they say helped save their lives. J.J. Dasher was sound asleep Tuesday morning when he says something stirred him awake. I kind of half opened my eyes and there was a, a figure just standing right over her bed. At first, he thought he was dreaming. I immediately just flew out of bed screaming and uh, started punching him, but he, at the same time, he's stabbing me. J.J. says he was stabbed 12 times. His right lung collapsed. Then the attacker turned on his wife, Ashley. I screamed at her to run. She ran out of the house towards the neighbors. He was still stabbing her as she was running all the way to, to the neighbor's porch, still stabbing her. Luckily, Ashley's screams woke up the Hathaways next door. She came screaming, and that's what woke us up. So we jumped out of bed, immediately called 911. Police arrived within a minute, and the attacker fled. An hour later, officers took a 15-year-old boy into custody. Ashley says she would have died on her neighbor's porch if they hadn't acted so fast. They weren't there. Like, it would be so different, but I'm really thankful for them. Every night, the Dashers lock their front door before going to bed, except for this past Monday. They tell us the 15-year-old just let himself into their home because the door was unlocked. We just turned out we forgot that night, um, but now we're going to definitely be more diligent, probably set up some more security. After being in the hospital for more than two days, the Dashers just want to be with their 10-year-old son. He's nonverbal autistic, and uh, luckily he just slept through it. Uh, even though it was, we were tremendous, it was extremely loud. If JJ could talk to the teen who randomly decided to attack him and his wife, he says he would just ask one question, why? I don't think I'm mad at him. It, it's, he must be in an unfortunate situation. I don't know if it's mental health issues, abusive household, I don't know. With JJ on the mend, he may be discharged as early as Thursday night. Ashley will likely stay in the hospital for a few more days. In Taylorsville, Jenna Bree, Fox 13 News, Utah. Wow, what a story. The Dashers have started a GoFundMe to cover the medical costs for both of their surgeries. You can find a link for that on our website, fox13now.com. In Vernal, uh, in, at Vernal Mid Middle School, I should say, a Vernal Middle School student is behind bars tonight, accused of bringing a gun to school this morning. The Uinta School District says someone reported the student before classes began. They say the school resource officer arrested the student right away and found the gun. Vernal police say the student had a plan and a specific target. Investigators then determined there were no other threats, no word yet on potential charges. The ACLU of Utah is criticizing local police for trying to, quote, arrest our way out of homelessness. Here are just a few of their findings in a report released earlier today. 
The ACLU found a big jump in anti-camping citations from Salt Lake City Police last fall after Mayor Aaron Mendenhall announced stricter enforcement. Citations in South Salt Lake also showed an increase. And while Unified Police did not cite as frequently, that department did expand their range, increasing citations on mountain roads. Another issue the report focused on is the court process for those anti-camping citations. The ACLU found in each case it took an average of three months to resolve, putting an extra burden on homeless people who have trouble managing court appearances and paying fines. And with the ACLU's harsh critiques of Salt Lake Police, I called the department to get their reaction and was told at this time they have no comment. In world news, protests in Iran are intensifying over the death of a woman in police custody. Demonstrators have been clashing with Iranian security forces in about a dozen cities. At least nine people have died in those clashes. Now the U.S. Treasury Department is sanctioning Iranian morality police, along with several other senior leaders, freezing their assets in the U.S. and making it illegal for Americans to do business with them. And tonight in Utah, the Iranian community is standing in solidarity with those in their homeland. Fox 13 News reporter Maithali Gubi was at a rally at the state capitol this evening. Women, life, freedom, people cheering for change. Iranians in Utah coming together to rally with their friends and family back home, protesting the current regime. Everybody on the street in Iran, they uh, they fighting with the police. Police try to shooting them. So we are here to raise the voice and ask support for Iran. This comes after a 22-year-old woman, Masa Amini, died in police custody. The officers claim she was not wearing her hijab or headscarf in the proper way. Her death is igniting protests across Iran and the world. And people who call Utah their home gathered at the state capitol. If I were in Iran, I'd definitely go to the street and protest. Although I'm, I am mean, um, I know that I might be dead if I go to the street. Some of the people we spoke to at the rally wanted us to keep their names and faces out because they're worried about possible retaliation by the Iranian government directed at themselves or their families. But they wanted to speak out about what's happening there. I thought it would be good uh, if we spread their stories and their suffering so that others can hear that. But we are here for showing solidarity. Maybe. <laughs> People held up signs. Women like freedom. Let chance. But you have a chance to do to be their voice. And stood Come with on, their community on, away from home to raise awareness about the challenges faced by people in Iran. What I would like to see most, more than anything else, is for, for them to contact their elected officials and demand to help Iranian people with getting free answer. That's the that's the biggest thing because that's what they're asking. But seeing people come together to fight for the rights of women and everyone, the demonstrators say is a step in the right direction. And I wanted to tell our people back in Iran that we are here for you. No matter how they censor you, no matter how they shut down the internet on you, we were here we can raise your voice and let the world know what is going on in Iran. On Capitol Hill, I am Might the Legal Beat. Fox 13 News, Utah. Women in Iran being the biggest. Yesterday's storms caused damage at Bryce Canyon National Park. Here's what it looks like on the Wall Street section of the Navajo Loop. That section is now closed while crews work to repair it. Park officials say the area got almost two inches of rain, the eighth highest daily total on record. Gosh, it was a much different story today with our weather for the yeah. very first day of mm. fall. We were right in that perfect temp zone, Allison. Mm, yeah, sweet spot. but those pictures from Bryce Canyon. Wow, that Wall Street area is like one of the most iconic parts of that national park and it is not even recognizable. So, wow. Yes, lots of cleaning up to do there. For the Wasatch Front tomorrow and tomorrow afternoon, you've got dry roads, so we are in the clear for the weekend. Tomorrow morning, it'll be cool. Grab the jacket early in the day, 50s. And for tomorrow 
in the afternoon. Temperatures into the mid 70s. We'll have a lot of sunshine for you here across the state. Satellite and radar does bring you to clear sky this evening and hour by hour into tomorrow morning. We'll have those temperatures into the 40s and 50s for many of you. So what we're going to be watching for this weekend will be a drying trend as we head into the next couple of days. So for tomorrow, cool and dry. It'll be a little breezy at times tomorrow with a light northwesterly lake breeze, and then we are heating up. Let's talk more about a beautiful fall weekend ahead and how long the nice weather will last. An Army veteran is walking thousands of miles to raise awareness for PTSD. He's been to a lot of places. What does he think about Utah? Coming up, I'll show you. She threatened to detonate a nuclear reactor at the University of Utah if the Utes football team lost. I don't know why people would do that. How students are reacting tonight. And it's down to 20. How you can weigh in on the proposed designs for Utah's next state flag. And perhaps you saw it coming but who did the Jazz get in return for Boyan Bogdanovich? Last week, we saw Utah's first upward trend in COVID-19 cases since mid-July, but now we're heading back down. State health officials reported a little more than 1,900 people tested positive over the past week. That is roughly a 24% decrease from the week prior. From those numbers to this, let's go ahead and take a look at the new drought map released today. The darker the color, the worse the drought. Now, the map is pretty much the the same as the past two weeks. State water officials say Utah's reservoirs are near the same level as they were this time last year. But the good news here, because our reservoirs started the season much lower this year than last, mm -hmm. that means Utahns have used less water over the summer. Happening tomorrow, several panel discussions will focus on the importance of the Great Salt Lake from perspectives of science, art, and culture. University of Utah is hosting the symposium. It's open to the public, runs from 9 to 5 tomorrow at the Natural History Museum of Utah and virtually on Zoom. Day two will be at Antelope Island State Park. An Army veteran right now walking from coast to coast, all to raise money to help other veterans battling PTSD. Jake Sansing is from Tennessee, but he's walking from Oregon to Maine. Mm. Gosh, what a trek. He started his journey in April. He made it to Utah this week. Fox 13 News reporter Emily Tenser caught up with him in Perry, Utah, as he continues his trek across the country. Step by step, mile by mile. Jake Sansing is making his way from Oregon all the way to Maine. It was always like, I don't know, kind of like giving myself a mission and a purpose. The Army veteran served two tours in Afghanistan from 2007 to 2011. When he returned to the U.S., he was homeless and battling PTSD. Yeah. When I first got out, I really didn't want anything to do with people. Walking to find work turned into walking from state to state. I don't really know what I was looking for, um, so I was doing it for different charities at the time. He wrote a book about it, and now he's raising money to create a nonprofit campground to help other veterans struggling with mental health. And I could always find a reason to keep walking, but I couldn't ever find a reason to stop walking. We caught up with him in Perry as he heads down towards Salt Lake. When it comes to food and shelter, it all depends on where he tires out or the friends he meets along the way. And his impression of Utah so far? Been almost overwhelming. <laughs> uh, the amount of kindness that I've gotten. A lot of people are stopping to try and give me a lot of things, but I actually carry everything I need. Everything in this one cart. He's hoping to reach Maine by May. Hoping other people see that it's not so bad out there, you know. There are a lot of good people out there. Jake will end Thursday's trek here in Willard, and he hopes to make it to Salt Lake City by Sunday. You can follow along with his journey on his Facebook page, Jake Walks America. Reporting in Box Elder County, Emily Tenser, Fox 13 News, Utah. Best of luck, Jake. Yeah.
And what a worthy cause, too. He had great weather to walk here in Utah today. I <laughs> hope that weather good. follows him throughout the rest of the I'll tell you what, instead of being here in early September, what a difference a few weeks make, right? So oh, for sure. we did hit uh, those 105, 106, 107 areas earlier in the month. And today, mid-70s. Now, we're below average today. We'll be comfortable again tomorrow. We've got a nice westerly flow here across the state with an area of low pressure off to our north and an area of high pressure off to our southeast. Here's what I want you to know for tomorrow morning. Grab the jacket as you're heading out for work, sending the kids out to school. They won't need it by the afternoon, so make sure you remind them to put it in their backpack when they're leaving school on a Friday. Temperatures, though, 40s and 50s early in the day. And for the Wasatch Front tomorrow, our temperatures will be only into the 70s again so you've got a really nice Friday ahead of you. I think I'm just going to go ahead and call it a top 10 weather day this year and on a Friday we love when that happens. Air quality will be good and we've got those temperatures that are going to be a little bit warmer as we head into the weekend and the rest of your seven day forecast. So across the state tomorrow Friday you're maybe going for a fall drive. The colors aren't that great up in the mountains right now. The alpine loops still kind of look like summer except once you get up to Cascade Springs. That place is beautiful right now. I'm sure it'll be busy this weekend. Uh, temperatures though in the 70s. So getting out, doing some hiking, doing some gardening. It is planting season. I think a lot of you will be out around the yard this weekend and you'll have dry conditions and also an increase in chance for some rain middle of next week for St. George. But next few days we are dry. That chance of precipitation is very low throughout your seven day forecast. For Ogden, as you look at your screen, you are also dry over the next week. By next Wednesday night, a few isolated storms are possible, but Provo, same thing. Nice weekend ahead. Few chances for some showers to develop towards the middle to end of next week. And then for St. George, your temps the next few days will be getting hot by Monday. You're back close to almost that triple digit mark by Monday and Tuesday but around 90 to 95 for much of the next week with lows in the 60s. So comfortable, mild mornings, great for biking, going out to Snow Canyon, maybe doing some hiking at the national parks. You can get into those recreation areas tomorrow because we're not expecting any flash flooding. So that's all good news as we get closer to the weekend. For the Wasatch Front, mid 70s for Friday, 80s after that. We are going to be warming up with those temperatures peaking next Wednesday in the upper 80s. So we're going to be warm again. We'll still have some air conditioner days as we head into next week. Nice mornings. Definitely going to have some chilly starts. We'll talk more about our chance for rain here in Salt Lake and also a look at your two week temperature outlook coming up in your super seven day forecast. Yeah, cool starts, Allison, but man, it gets hot mid yeah, next week. Yeah, summer's coming back. <laughs> Feels like it. Straight ahead, we are going to give you a look inside the new emergency room coming to the city of Harriman. Why first responders say it is so important. Welcome back everyone. The first and only emergency room in Harriman will open its doors to meet the healthcare needs of the growing community. Take a look at this. Yeah. They even did it without a countdown. How did they do that? Mountain Star Healthcare held a ribbon cutting today at the new Harriman Emergency Center, which will be staffed by Lone Peak Hospital ER nurses and board certified physicians. The freestanding ER, meaning it is not connected to a hospital, is complete with 10 patient exam rooms, 24 seven emergency medical care, as well as lab and imaging services. Mountain Star says they're committed to bringing quality care closer to home for patients. Each emergency is different. And so having an emergency center that can not only help the city of Harriman, but also South Jordan and Riverton um, really gives back and can help save a life. Our closest hospital, uh, we're looking at about a 10 minute transport time. We're excited to announce that this will actually decrease our transport times and eliminate it by about half. And that's extremely important when minutes and seconds count in an emergency. And to keep the celebration going tonight, members of the public toured the new ER center with their children to help get kids more comfortable with a hospital setting. The little ones brought their favorite stuffed animals to demonstrate things on like CT scans, x-rays, ultrasounds, and wound care. The Harriman Emergency Center officially opens on October 12th. <laughs> 
University of Utah engineering student is accused of making a threat to detonate a nuclear reactor on campus. What campus police and students say about a unique incident. The Bureau of Land Management is about to decide where to let Jeeps and ATVs drive on some of the most popular terrain around Moab. We'll show you the options and what's at stake. These are the semifinalists for the new state flag and you get to weigh in on them. And one of the most popular teams in all of North America visiting Sandy tonight. How did RSL do on the pitch. Well, tonight we're learning more about a University of Utah student's arrest for allegedly making threats to detonate a nuclear reactor on campus if the Utes lost their game against San Diego State last Saturday. Fox 13 News reporter Chris Arnold spoke with university police and students about this unique incident. Shock? Yeah, that is very disturbing. That's totally messed up. And surprise from University of Utah students. After learning one of their own made a threat last weekend to detonate a nuclear reactor on campus. It is very bizarre to me. I don't know why people would do that. 21-year-old Meredith Miller, an engineering student at the U, was listed in the probable cause statement, saying she posted on the social media platform Yik Yak prior to the Utes game against San Diego State last Saturday that if the team did not win the game, she would detonate the reactor causing mass destruction. First of all, I mean, it, it's, it, it would be impossible to detonate the reactor on campus. Uh, this one is unique because it's never been uh, a threat to the reactor. University of Utah Interim Police Chief Jason Anahosa says, although Miller said her statement was meant to be a joke, they have a zero tolerance policy for these kinds of threats. Even if they're completely incapable of carrying out the, uh, the threat or if that's uh, the, the threat is made but an attempt is not, it, it's still the same charge. Chief Inahosa says it's also a good reminder to be aware of what can happen when you post things like this on social media. If it was meant as a joke, which, you know, given the wording of, of the, uh, the actual post, if the Utes don't win, uh, yeah, so, so I think it is a good message to be careful and, and uh, think before you post. He says the message to the public and the campus community is that when these threats come in, they take them very seriously. Well, people pay more attention to what people post if there's something suspicious that they tell someone about it. Well, Miller was arrested and booked into the Salt Lake County Jail on Wednesday. Police say she has since been released. Now she's facing one charge of making a terroristic threat, which is a second degree felony. At the U, Chris Arnold, Fox 13 News, Utah. We are learning more about a pileup involving six vehicles that left a man dead in Cache County this morning. It happened just after 6.15 a.m. on Highway 8991 near 3200 South in Logan. The crash shut down that road for five hours. According to Utah Highway Patrol, a black Ford F-150, 150 rather, heading south, drifted into northbound traffic and crashed into three other cars. A 32-year-old driver of one of those cars died at the scene. Another driver was sent to the hospital in critical condition. Uh, the circumstances of what led up to the crash remain under investigation. Authorities are responding to a fire at the Lila Canyon Mine. The mine is south in southeastern Utah. It's one of the state's largest. The Utah Division of Oil, Gas and Mining tells Fox 13 News the fire started yesterday yesterday morning. It is still burning tonight. The miners were safely evacuated and no injuries have been reported. No one will be allowed in the mine until federal officials arrive from Colorado to assess the situation. In the next six months, the Bureau of Land Management will decide how much of some prime recreational real estate will be open to off-road vehicles from Jeeps to ATVs to motorcycles. Going in-depth for us tonight, Fox 13 News anchor Max Roth got the chance to talk with people hoping for different outcomes. Each of them invested financially and personally. Labyrinth Canyon is one of the most treasured stretches of river in Utah. It's where the Green River flows gently through red rock with those twists and turns that are a trademark of Utah's unique landscapes. Lauren Wood is trip director and co-owner of Holiday River Expeditions. It's not as well known as the Colorado or the Grand Canyon, but it's uh, on that level of truly scenic, beautiful wilderness and um, relatively untouched wilderness experience when you're out there on the right day. 
Wood's family has run rafts down the river for 50 years. The trips made meaningful by the experience of solitude. There are um, places that should remain quiet. And on a on a deep human level, I see the way people change on a four or five day river trip and their shoulders come down. They don't have that weight of the world on them by day five. One of the strong mandates of our club is that we try to train them to be good stewards of the land. Rex Holman is the business manager for Red Rocks Four Wheelers. They run the Moab Jeep Safari, the biggest event in town every year, and it's been running for 56 years. It runs nine days. We bring in excess of 2,000 Jeeps to town from all over the country. Along with the beautiful desert, Holman says Moab's mining history has created a wonderland of remote roads perfect for people who love to explore on motorcycles, OHVs, and 4x4s. It has become a significant event uh, to the economy of Moab. The BLM will decide under court order on a new travel management plan by March, and they're considering four alternatives. Alternative A, all access, the status quo, an unlikely choice according to the people I spoke with. In the next three maps, you'll see some red for closed roads. All the blue are open. Alternative B is most restrictive to motorized vehicles. Alternative C could be considered a compromise. And alternative D is almost all access. The public can comment on this until October 7th, and then the BLM will take some time and make the final decision by March. Now, if you want to comment or look at the plans, we'll get you to the right place from fox13now.com. In studio, Max Roth, Fox 13 News, Utah. Coming up, the DWR is launching a drone fleet. What they'll be used for. Plus, pushback against so-called family-friendly drag shows here in Utah. Tonight, a call to action. One group's plan in defense of drag. Welcome back. There are a lot of open spaces in Utah, and that can make it difficult for DWR officers to do their jobs. But now they have a great new tool, the first ever drone team to track down lawbreakers. So far, five officers around the state have been trained and licensed to use unmanned aerial drones. One main use will be to investigate poaching cases. The Division of Wildlife or law enforcement officers are public servants, and that's kind of what this tool is used for, whether it's to solve a wildlife crime or help for, look for a lost child in, in you know, a, a, a search and rescue mission. The drones will also be used to help biologists conduct wildlife surveys, and they will be a big help, especially in rural areas, in the search and rescue of people who need their help, like this one near St. George. A group opposed to drag queen shows held a rally in downtown Salt Lake City this evening. A handful of people gathered at the Gallivan Center. They carried signs that expressed their opposition to drag queens, which is usually men who dress up and perform as women. A larger group of counter protesters called the Armed Queers of Salt Lake City showed up as well. I'm going to take this one because I have my kids here with me to come and watch the queens. And for me, it's super important that they get to see representation from all walks of life. Um, I think that, you know, self-expression is everybody's right, regardless of race, religion, color, economic status. Well, the group protesting the drag queen shows declined an opportunity to talk on camera. Well, coming up, a little bit of smoke in the air tomorrow. Not too bad, just some haze that you'll maybe notice as we head into the weekend. Coming up, I'll let you know how long our cool weather will last. And later in sports, wait until you see this goal by RSL tonight. Folks will be talking about it for years to come, I think. And another starter gone in jazz land is only Mike Conley now remains in Utah at this point. But what did Utah score in return for Boyan Bogdanovich? Back in a bit. We are hopeful that this process honors that tradition and at the same time brings us forward to help us celebrate the things that matter to us today as well. Here is your chance to weigh in on the new Utah state flag. State leaders want to know what you like and what you don't like in a series of new designs. And there are some really, really cool ones to choose from. Fox 13 News political reporter Ben Winslow has the story from Utah's Capitol Hill. Any one of these could be the next Utah state flag. 
These 20 flags are semi-finalists in the process to design a new flag. I think it's a flag that really represents Utah well. Benjamin Benson and Angelina Nading are students who came up with two of the designs. I had put blue as the background to represent strength and power, and I maintained the beehive symbol because it represents industry and Utah is known as the beehive state. So I wanted to keep those simple symbols um, all together in our flag so it's not as complicated but still represents us. It's the navy blue background with the sago lily on it with the eight pointed star. It's a nod to both our eight tribal nations as well as our pioneer settlers and that was really important for me to represent. The current state flag has been criticized as just a state seal on a blue bed sheet. So the legislature passed a bill to start a public process to create a new flag. Over the years Utah's flag has been updated three times but until now Utahns have never had a chance to weigh in. More than 5,000 ideas were submitted from across Utah. This has been a four-year journey to get to this point, and it's really remarkable to see them flying on a flagpole. I'm the flags incorporate similar themes. Eight points on stars to represent Utah's eight sovereign tribes, nods to the Red Rock of southern Utah and the snow-capped mountains in the north. We want to know what the public has to say about them. Utah's Department of Cultural and Community Engagement is putting them on display for you to see up close and personal. Feedback may still alter the designs as a task force picks a final one. Tell us why you like that. You know, I like that. I like the I like the beehive, and I like the 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 the, the paying tribute to our to our native tribes. But I also like the I also like the the uh, I also like the representation of the the white our mountains. I love that. When you print them at this scale. Some things that I didn't love about certain flags, I now actually really like about them. The flags will be on display here at the state capitol, at Southern Utah University, and at the Cache County Historic Courthouse until October 5th. The public comment period goes until then, too. After that, the legislature decides on a final design. On the Hill, Ben Winslow, Fox 13 News, Utah. Okay, earlier today, Fox 13 News conducted a poll on our website asking which flag design is your favorite. Here's a look at some of those results. One of the flags, as you can see, has a strong lead at 21%. As Ben mentioned, the official vote is on flag.utah.gov. It is open until October 5th. Also on Utah's Capitol Hill today, a celebration of the Lao American community in Utah. The Lao American Buddhist Monks Council began its general conference today at the Capitol. The day included this traditional dance. Citizens and legislators also engaged in an interfaith dialogue and celebrated the new temple in West Valley City. That see Utah as a place where uh, you know interfaith conversation can happen in a respectful way. And as stated by the Senate President, we're a very religious state, uh, family-oriented, and it is, is, those are the very same um, values that our uh, Leo Buddhist brothers and sisters share. The conference will continue tomorrow and will end with celebrations at the Wat Lao Buddharam Buddhist Temple in West Valley City on Sunday. A special Olympics soccer match in Farmington was a lot of fun for kids and their parents today. Go, Ellie! Get the ball, Ellie! Yeah, Ellie! She said she had a blast, and she also says she loves having her mom and friends there cheering her on. This tournament is part of First Lady Abby Cox's Show Up initiative. Teams from eight schools in the Davis School District took part, and you can just tell how excited this young man was after his soccer match. Take a listen. Oh, it was amazing, and... I've never gotten this energized before. This is the first time in my life this has happened. Oh, good, Trent. Oh, that is I'm so wonderful. glad we were there to capture yes. it on camera. You go, Trent. That's fantastic. Parents say events like these give their kids something to think and talk about for a really long time, as well as giving them something to look forward to in the next event. Oh my goodness, I love that. Wish I could have been there in person. It was such a nice day today. Tomorrow will be another nice day for whatever activities you have planned or maybe you're stuck working tomorrow. I feel you there. Temperatures in the 50s and 60s when you wake up during the morning hours tomorrow. 
We'll have a few areas even into the 40s and maybe even 30s for Bryce Canyon. Chilly there as they continue to clean up from record rainfall. Forecast at a glance for Salt Lake tomorrow, 75, Ogden 74, Provo 74. Plenty of sunshine across the board. Cedar 77, same thing in Ridgefield and St. George 90 degrees. I think for many of you, your favorite temperature may be in the 70s. Very comfortable temps. So we've got some perfect days ahead of us. Moab 82 tomorrow, 74 in Price, 72 degrees in Vernal. Flash flood potential for tomorrow is not expected. I love to see this, especially on a Friday, especially on a Friday after what's been a very hot start to the month. Then we had tons of flooding concerns. So you can get outside. Heat's not going to be a problem tomorrow. It'll be warm this weekend in St. George, so make sure you're packing plenty of water if you're going to be recreating in southern Utah. But mid-90s for Saturday and Sunday tomorrow, about 90 in St. George. Overnight temps in the 60s. Now let's break down what you can expect here in Salt Lake over the next few days. Saturday, 80, 81 on Sunday. We're going to have those temperatures a little bit hotter into next week. And our rain chances here in Salt Lake are very low. We're going to keep you dry the next several days. And then by middle of next week, could see a few isolated showers. And of course, the big question is, OK, what about the beginning of October? What can we expect for temperatures last part of the month through the early part of October? This is the 30th of September through the 6th of October. We're going to have things above average temperature wise here in Utah. And for that same time frame, we look at our precipitation outlook. We likely turn things at the very end of September into the first part of October to above average precipitation. So we could have some more rain in the forecast for week two. But next few days, things will be very comfortable. We'll have cool mornings, so make sure you're wearing a jacket. If you're going to be going for a walk first thing in the morning, it'll be in the 50s. But then look at those temps in the afternoons. The 70s tomorrow across much of the state. Three years ago, the Jazz acquired one of their best free agent signings in program history, recruiting Boyan Bogdanovich to complement star pieces like Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert. And though that experiment never generated results in the playoffs, Bogey averaged a little over 18 points a game here in a Jazz uniform. But with Spida and the Stifle Tower already gone, it's no surprise to see Bogdanovich follow suit, though what Utah got in return might be. Sent to the Detroit Pistons this morning in return for Kelly Olenek, a six foot 11 center out of Gonzaga who's played nine seasons in the league split between Boston, Miami, Houston and Detroit also coming to Salt Lake in the deal is reserve guard Saban Lee who was actually drafted by the Jazz in 2020 and then shipped to the Pistons on draft night. But unlike previous moves this summer no draft capital is coming Utah's way. The team does carve out some of its luxury tax bill though as a result. Former Ute point guard Andre Miller has accepted the head coaching job of the G League's Grand Rapids Gold, taking over for Jason Terry, who recently joined Will Hardy's staff with the Jazz. Miller helped lead Utah to the 1998 National Championship game before embarking on a 17-year NBA career. Real Salt Lake has some time away from uh, MLS play, but when they do return, it'll be game on to earn a playoff spot, currently on the outside looking in, but they're not far away from the pitch altogether. In fact, tonight at America First Field, the Claret and Cobalt hosted Atlas FC, part of the league's cup showcase between various clubs from the States and Mexico. RSL down several guys off on international duty, but they called up some monarchs and played right with Atlas. Here's one of them. Bodie Hidalgo's header just poked away by Jose Hernandez. But then in the 17th, Aaron Herrera notices Hernandez in dangerous territory. And so he launches from a mile and connects. What moxie, what leg strength, what a goal. 70 yards maybe, I don't know. But then a tough one. Justin Miram gets called for a straight red card after nearly kicking a player in the face here, forcing RSL a man down the rest of the way. Edgar Zaldivar right before the break, tying it up. And then they kept him at bay with 10 guys on the field, but not forever. Atlas for the lead here in the 71st. It's 2-1 to one late. Tony Finau is back on the golf course this afternoon for the start of the President's Cup. Finau teamed up with Max Homa for the red, white, and blue against Team International. Nice approach by the Salt Lake native setting up Homa to complete the birdie at number two. They were up a couple of uh, holes before Taylor Pendrith 
and Mito Pereira rallied to tie it, but this miss by Pendrith gave Finau and Homa the win one up. The Americans lead 4-1 overall. And Utah Volleyball opened up Pac-12 play against Colorado at home. Red needing to rally more than once in the opening set. And they did. Megan Yetz's serve off the net, tying it at 23. But the Lady Buffs got the last two points to set the tone with set number one and then dominating set two. Maya Tabrone leading everybody with 10 kills. So give CU the sweep tonight. Oh, wow. Tough match there. Yeah. RSL still going, trying to pull out a what result. What a wild game. Insane. Late night. Tough My team, goodness. though, from Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Morgan. We'll be right back. Finally, Utah has the Battle of the Brothers and the Holy War. But after a 60-year hiatus, another grudge match is returning. Oh, yeah, the Battle of the Axe is back. I wondered when it would come back. <laughs> it began in 1937 when then Branch Agricultural College in Cedar City and Dixie Junior College in St. George met on the gridiron. Each school created an axe, and the loser presented theirs to the winner. The teams are now Southern Utah University and Utah Tech University. They're both in the whack. The new Battle of the Axe will feature the Thunderbirds and the Trailblazers, and their first game is Saturday at Eccles Coliseum in Cedar City. Thanks for joining us. Quick Cast is next.